Good morning. We welcome you to worship. We are so glad to have you today as we celebrate the great gifts that our God has given us and celebrate today that very blessing of the Holy Trinity. So I'm Pastor Kurt Ebert. For any who are guests with us today, we are so glad to have you joining us. And so a couple of announcements to start us off. But first off, we invite you to grab the red fellowship pad that can be found at the end of your row. We invite you to go ahead and sign in. So we invite you to join us later today after our late service for our congregational annual meeting is that we'll be uh, gathering together to work together as that people of God towards setting that direction for our church and accomplishing that mission God has given. Is that we'll be electing ministry leaders as well as approving our annual budget as well as hearing updates and participating in conversation regarding where we are going as a congregation. So we hope that you join us. Uh, that should start right about between 11.50 and you know, noon right around that time. Uh, just after the late service. So we hope that you come back and join us for that. The time is here for the sanctuary lighting project to begin. Is that hopefully you're as excited as we are to be able to get this project accomplished and to continue to beautify God's sanctuary here. That means that next weekend is that we will be starting our worship in the gym. Is that we are planning to be down there for multiple weeks. Unfortunately, they can't do it all in one week. But the fact is, is that they will be uh, beautifying our sanctuary in so many ways. And so join us next week as we have many special opportunities gathering together. Same worship times, same worship styles as normal. We'll just be gathering in the gym as a part of that. That also next Sunday morning, we will be installing our new youth intern, Brian Cromer, is that he'll be installed at both the uh, 8 and 1045 service next Sunday morning. So we hope that you join us for that. There will be a gift card shower as we welcome Brian to our very gathering. So that if you have time and opportunity this week to help us get prepared for that, later today at about 2 o'clock, we'll be gathering to help clear the sanctuary in preparation for that lighting project. Or on Tuesday night at 6.30, we'll be helping get the gym prepared uh, to set up that worship space. The last thing I'll just note is that this is that last chance to get signed up for our women's and men's summer Bible studies. Please go ahead and check out more details in your bulletin or the info tables back in the uh, narthex on your way out. But at this time, as we celebrate the gift of the Holy Trinity, we invite you to stand for our opening hymn. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. The earth was without form and void, and the darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Creation begins with the presence and activity of all three persons of the Trinity. Our lives as Christians in baptism 
begin in baptism in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We take a moment of silence to confess our own individual sins. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. With the glory of your holy name. Amen. That Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake he forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Let us pray. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, accept our praise for our creation, redemption, and sanctification. We bless you that you have called us to be yours. By your grace, direct our lives that we may ever be your holy people who walk worthily in your ways. 
For you, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, live and reign one God, now and forever. Amen. This time the congregation may be seated as we invite for the children of the congregation for our children's message. You guys can come on down. I invite you forward today. So glad to have each of you with us today in worship. Got a couple more coming. Well, good morning, everybody. So I want you to think with me today. Is it, is it easier to make a promise or to keep a promise? What do you think? Do you think it's easier to make a promise or keep a promise? See, sometimes I don't always think about how hard it's going to be, or I think it's a lot easier, so I, I promise I'm going to do that. I'll be there at this time, or I'll do this. But then life gets hard, right? Life gets busy. It's that it's sometimes hard to keep those promises that we make. But now I want you to think about this. What if, what if I were to make you a promise, but you had to wait for that promise to come? Now, how hard is it to wait for a promise? I mean, if I promised you, I promise that I'm going to get you an amazing Christmas present, you only have to wait nearly seven months. Are you going to be excited about that? No, probably not. Is that, what if I promised you I am going to give you one of those huge, gigantic candy bars in about 25 years? Does the, I've never seen such a sad face. Like, what? See, today in our gospel reading, we are going to hear Jesus talk about Abraham. Have you heard about Abraham before? that Abraham was one of God's special friends. And God promised Abraham that he was going to bless the world through him. That he was going to send a son. That he was going to bless his descendants. That he was going to make this very family of Abraham to be so huge. But do you know how many children Abraham had at that time? None at all. Zero. So God promised, I'm going to give you a son. And Abraham, like a child, kept on asking, is it time? Is it time? Is it time? Abraham had to wait many, many years. And today in our gospel reading, we'll hear that even in the son Isaac, that Isaac wasn't the full fulfillment of that promise. That God fulfilled his promise. In Abraham's great, 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 great grandson by the name of Jesus. That's a long time to wait. It was almost like 1,800, 2,000 years. That's a long time to wait. But God's timing is different than ours, right? We can trust God even if it takes a long time, right? That God does not promise what he does not fulfill. And so today, what does God promise? That he promises that in those waters of baptism that we were made a part of his family. He promises right there in his word that we are forgiven and loved. That he promises that every prayer that we speak, that he hears. And he will answer in his way, in his time, for our very good. So today, let's celebrate that even though sometimes we have to wait, <laughs> that God's promises are good. And so I invite you to fold your hands, bow your heads. Let's pray. I invite you and the congregation to repeat after me. Dear Father, Dear Father we, thank we thank you for the promise, for the promise of, Jesus. of Jesus. Help us, Help us to celebrate every day your grace to us. Help us be patient to receive your answers to our prayers. Amen. All right, you can head on back to your seats as we now hear from that word of God.
Holy Trinity weekend is Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading is from Acts of the Apostles as we hear the continuation of Peter's great Pentecost sermon. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed the crowd. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pains of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced, my flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. This is the word of the Lord. this Holy Trinity Sunday from St. John chapter 8. The Jews answered Jesus, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my Father and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets, yet you say, If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who died and the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. 
but you have not known him. Is that I have I know him? If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And so they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Congregation may be seated for our hymn. Grace and peace be unto you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we have a simple topic before us, the Holy Trinity. I'll go ahead and give you just a minute or two to talk amongst yourselves and figure that one out, and we'll see what we go ahead and come up with. Ah, That's probably not the best idea. There's a little bit more there that can be plumbed than sometimes we can fully comprehend. And yet today we come to celebrate, to give thanks to God for who he is and what he has done for us. Today we come to wrestle and think through the very things that are there. Today we come to John chapter 8 that begins to speak of that very fact. That in the midst of God confessing who he is and what he has done, it is not always well received. That Jesus' sermon today starts off with them accusing him of having a demon and then ends with, him, with them being, picking up rocks, being ready to throw at him. It comforts me that all of Jesus' sermons did not land well like my own sometimes don't. But I think his for a different reason. His hit a little too close to home. His hit with all too much truth. The fact is, as we step into the midst of John chapter 8 today, we come to wrestle with with something so much bigger than ourselves, so much bigger than our desires, so much bigger than our minds, so much bigger than the things that we might explain or in so many ways begin to try to reason out. See, in his classic mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis puts before us that everyone must make a choice of this Jesus and who he claims to be. And in so many ways throughout the centuries, those, three cho- those choices have come down to three. That either Jesus is a liar, for someone who comes and claims to be the Son of God, someone who claims such authority, such power, claims such things. Is that how... 
Can it be true in our mind that some might simply say him to be one who misrepresents the truth, that others might go ahead and say that he may not be a liar, that he might simply be a lunatic. I mean, if someone came up to you in the midst of your life and said, Hi, I'm the Son of God, what would your first reaction be? Oh, tell me more about that. When you think about these things, that yes, there are some out there in this world that might argue him to be a liar or a lunatic. But the fact is, is that when we look at the life and the ministry of Jesus, is that those who seek by their lies and deceit to somehow gather all sorts of power and authority and control and this and that, do we see any of that in the life of Jesus? That all of his authority he gave away, all of his life he gave, is that he gave up his very self. He died in the very midst of this. That others might be built up, that others might be loved, that others might be welcomed. That sounds like no liar that I know. And also the same thing can be said is that yes, it can be said that the very love and the depth that Jesus showed of care and compassion and affection towards others, the fact that he healed the sick, that he fed the very hungry, that he in so many ways cared for the poor and so many others, that he forgave sinners, included the outcast, preached peace and love and joy and hope and the very truth of God and God the Father, It does not look like he is one who is so quickly labeled a lunatic. So C.S. Lewis says there is only one other explanation. That he is the very Lord that he claims to be. That he is the very one who he says that he is. But today in John chapter 8 we see that very argument, that very debate going on is that Jesus isn't speaking to atheists who don't believe in God. He isn't speaking to agnostics who just say, I I really just don't know. That it says earlier in this very chapter that Jesus began to say to those who had believed on him. (laughs) That Jesus isn't talking to those who are critics or those who are persecutors, or those who are resisting him, but those who began to believe in him, and yet so quickly his sermon goes awry. They turn against him, starting with name-calling and threats and everything else that is there. Why? Because of his very claim to be Lord. Is that Jesus comes and makes great claims about Abraham. He makes great claims about himself. He makes these great claims of what is there. He goes around and he says these very things. That when they say, you aren't even 50 years old, how can you be before Abraham? Jesus says that before Abraham was, I am. Now, if you think through some of those other passages of the Old Testament, I don't know, like this burning bush situation out there with Moses, is that who did God say that he was? But the great I am. So the question is this. In a world that is still constantly debating about who is this Jesus? Is it how do we make sense of who this Jesus is and what he claims and where that fits in our life or in our world in so many other ways? Is that where will we fall on that very debate? That you look out there and you don't have to look very far 
And there will be person after person that will make that very claim. That how did Jesus become the Son of God? How did it become that this Jesus was named that very Son on par with the Father? Well, it all started with this nice little Jewish boy named Jesus who just cared for the poor and sought to care for others, that he did so many things, is that he struck a nerve. And in the midst of all of those power politics of the first century is that this Jewish man named Jesus, this preacher and proclaimer, found himself in the wrong spot at the wrong time. And the Romans and the high priests simply put him to death. And then after a long, long time of history is that as people continue to claim that somehow this Jesus lived on within them and their community is that in the year 325 A.D. at a little council called Nicaea overseen by this Roman emperor by the name of Constantine that that's when Jesus was declared the Son of God. You don't have to go very far to hear some very intelligent people who have some very long degrees behind their names somehow claim this very myth. (laughs) Who's telling stories? Those who simply somehow believe that Jesus somehow grew into this reality. That how then In the first century A.D. are those who saw him already picking up rocks, getting ready to throw them at him because they know of what he is claiming. (laughs) So what about us? Where will Jesus find his way, his place, his space within our own lives? Then why did those who had believed in him, turned so drastically against him. Because they thought they had God pegged. They thought they had God all figured out. They thought that they were the ones that said, this is who he is, and this is how he works, and that this is how far he may come and no further. Will we let God be God? Or will we be those who tell him how he should be? So what does Jesus say to them today? That he says those very words that he proclaims, that I, that you say that he is our God, but you have not known him. I know him is that Jesus is the one and the only one who does reveal the Father as he truly is. That Jesus is the only one who knows the Father in a way that we can only hope to begin to experience. That when God comes down into the midst of our very life, how do we react with name-calling and threats That when one comes down with mercy and peace and forgiveness and grace, what do we call him but a liar and a lunatic and we put him to death? Now maybe you've heard this expression before. Maybe you've said this expression before. I don't know, maybe it takes you all the way back to when you were a child. You've heard those famous words. Don't make me come down there. Has anyone heard those words before? Has anyone heard those from their wife before? So that what do we think about those very things? We hear it as that threat. We hear it as that threat of punishment that mom or dad is going to have to come down those stairs and straighten out our our squabbling or our fighting or our problems or our bickering. That we see it that, that, that mom or dad's just going to have to come down and set us straight. Punishment. 
But when Jesus comes down, does he threaten with those words, don't make me come down there? No, he comes down voluntarily. The very one who comes proclaiming peace receives death. The very one who has compassion, who preaches freedom to the prisoner, hope to the poor, love and acceptance to the outcast and the sinner, how do we respond to him who comes down to us with love? We throw him out, cast him aside, and we crucify him. What does that say about us? But more importantly, what does that say about God? That he knows that this is how we would respond. That he knows that we are those who are stubborn and sinful and in so many ways will not receive him. And yet, what does he do? That he comes down and he takes our place and our punishment and takes our sin and nails it to that cross. That too often in this life, I think that we feel like we're all alone. That somehow we, if our prayers aren't answered in a timely manner, or if somehow problems or pains may come, is that where is God or how can he let this be? Is that, is it crazy? Is it a lie? And we begin to doubt and despair and we begin to do all sorts of things and we begin to feel all alone. So a number of years ago that I found myself in the midst of one of those moments that I felt alone. My family and I were there in the midst of Yellowstone National Park. I think we went on about a three-mile hike that afternoon that we were all alone on that very trail. No one around. And yet the fact was that in the midst of that very place that I felt less alone than I had never ever felt before. The very God of creation who made such beauty, such blessing, such glorious grace is the same God who created the world and the universe that is so much bigger than me and my problems and my struggles. And he is the one who came down for me in love. But how does the psalmist put it today? How does he begin to speak those words to us? That when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Who are we? The God of creation would send his only begotten son. Who are we? that the very Father and the Son would send the Spirit to make us a part of that very family and that people in those waters of baptism and welcome us day after day, that same God who promises, never will I leave, never will I forsake, never will you be alone. So what does Jesus promise? That in the midst of this life, wherever you are, that though you may feel alone, know this, that there will be a day when I will come to you and I will take you to be with me. For in my Father's house are many rooms. If If it were not true, I would not tell you. But I go to prepare a place place for you and I will come and take you to be with me. This Holy Trinity Sunday, 
Certainly we can go ahead and have a nice long dry lecture of how God could be one in three and three in one. Or we can celebrate who God is and how he has come to us. That love come down of that Father, that Son, and that Spirit who is not way up there but down here in our midst working in your life. May that good news of Christ and him crucified give you this day and every day that peace that surpasses all understanding that guards your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. And so at this time, I invite you to please stand as we go to confession of our faith, as we confess with the Christian church throughout time and history, as today we join together in that Athanasian creed more than 15 centuries after is written, that we still continue to confess the truth of what our God is. And so we join. Whoever desires to be saved must, above all, hold the Catholic faith. And the Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance. For the Father is one person, the Son is another, and the Holy Spirit is another. But the Godhead of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit is one. The glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father uncreated, the Son uncreated, the Holy Spirit uncreated. The Father infinite, the Son infinite, the Holy Spirit infinite. The Father eternal, the Son eternal the Holy Spirit eternal. And yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal. Just as there are not three uncreated or three infinites, but one uncreated and one infinite. In the same way, the Father is almighty, the Son almighty, and the Holy Spirit almighty. And yet there are not three almighties, but one almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. And yet there are not three gods, but one God. So the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord. And yet there are not three lords, but one Lord. Amen. And so today we give thanks that our God is at work within us. And he is the one who continues to work in all things. And so today we give thanks for all of his blessings and care. And we lift up a prayer for our offerings. Please pray with me. That, Heavenly Father, your grace for us surpasses all of our imagination. Your care for us is present every day, even in the midst of our times of loneliness. We thank you this day for the blessings of faith, hope, and love. May these gifts of grace stir in us a true generosity of spirit and a true motivation toward love. Bless the gifts and the offerings that are presented today for the furthering of your kingdom, whether through the ministries of Calvary or through the many partners in the gospel who we support. Bless this congregation and the very word that proclaims and sends forth from it, that we may continue to be a people with a mission. All this we proclaim and pray in the very name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, we lift our prayers of heart and soul to you this day. Heavenly Father, guard your church from conflict, division, or compromise, so that we may walk as one in your truth. Let the light of your word shine through us so that others may see our good works and give glory to you in heaven. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord Jesus, bless the work of pastors, teachers, and missionaries and leaders within your church. Give zeal to your people as we draw closer to you in faith. May we confess you as Lord and Christ with one voice and as one people. Unite us together in direction and purpose. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Spirit, grant your healing touch to the sick, the sorrowful, and for all who have asked for our prayers. We know that there are many in our prayers today that are in need of your care. Be with Bailey, who is hospitalized, Denny Morrison as he prepares for surgery. Be with Gary Moore and John Angelus as they recover from surgery. Grant your care to be with Jim Birdwell, Jill Gunther, Ramona Cunningham, and so many others who are on our hearts or our minds today. 
Meet them according to their needs, and may you, O Lord, allow your will to be done within their lives. We also lift up prayers for those who find themselves in times of mourning. Be with the family and friends of Steve Horsley, as well as the family and friends of Bill Boer, the father of Gary Boer. Comfort them now in this time of loss and continue to guide them in the days ahead, directing their attention to the very hope and promises that are ours in Christ and the very resurrection to come. We also give thanks, O Lord, with Pastor Sam and Molly Trammell at the birth of their daughter, Lucy Jo, earlier this week. We pray that you would continue to grant your protection to Lucy Jo and bring her soon to those very waters of holy baptism that you may renew in her life and all lives the very gift of faith and trust in you. We also pray, O God, that you would be with us for our annual meeting later today. May we make decisions that are pleasing in your sight, and may you continue to guide our congregation in so many ways. We pray for the ministry and outreach of Camp Lakeview as they begin their summer programs. May you help them in all things to proclaim that good news of Christ and that all may be strengthened and grow in faith in you. That, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. That all honor and glory are yours, O blessed Holy Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in your holy church, now and ever unto all the ages of ages. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, who with your only begotten Son and the Holy Spirit are one God, one Lord. In the confession of the only true God, we worship the Trinity in person and the unity in substance of majesty co-equal. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. But our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat this in my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, strengthen and preserve you in true faith to life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Amen. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the holy supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage that, on the day of his coming, we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Bless you this week in all of his gifts and promises. Amen. <laughs>